Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out, tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about pets. So welcome back to The Endless Knot, where we are today really, really going to be actually talking about something light and fluffy. Pretty much. Pretty fluffy. Pretty fluffy. (laughs) So yeah, we don't have any major feedback, I don't think, from previous episodes, so we can get right back into it. Today we are going to be talking about pets, though one caveat, neither of us are in any way specialists on this topic. (laughs) And there is, in fact, quite a lot of work that's been done on animals in the ancient world and animals in the medieval world. So this is not going to be comprehensive, but we thought we'd go through some fun facts, fun literature, and fun etymologies for a number of pets Mm -hmm. from our respective periods. So I'll put links to better sources than us in our show notes. (laughs) You can investigate further if you want. But first, cocktails. Indeed. So this one wasn't too hard for once to find a theme with a cocktail. (laughs) They're a fair number, in fact. Yeah. Could have gone with. But I went with one that I've always wanted to try, actually, and just have never had because we don't normally have this juice on hand. So we are having salty dog cocktails, Mm -hmm. which is essentially, I am told, a greyhound cocktail with a salt rim. Now, a greyhound cocktail is gin and grapefruit juice. And it's the grapefruit juice we don't normally have on hand, so I haven't tried it before. So that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. It's nice. Yeah. Taste of grapefruit juice. And salt. And salt. <laughs> Very salty. Mm. But it's nice. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of juice yeah. to the amount of gin, so it yeah. mostly tastes of grapefruit juice. Very grapefruity. Mm-hmm. But since it's actually fresh grapefruit juice, it's actually tasty. Mm. Not really a big fan of canned grapefruit juice, which is, I think, why we don't normally make it. All right. Well, if that was refreshing enough to make us ready to get going, mm-hmm. shall we begin? Sure. So we'll start with the word pet itself. Mm-hmm. And in what will be... No doubt a running theme in the etymologies today. The origins of this word are mysterious. (laughs) (laughs) Right. There are a few theories. Okay. So one is that it may be connected somehow or at least influenced by the word petty. Mm. Meaning sort of small. Small, I guess in the sense of small, which is related to French petit. Mm Mm-hmm. But that doesn't get us very far because we don't really know where the word petit comes from. Oh. It's not a native Latin word. (laughs) Huh. There's a a late Latin form that is probably that word. But where that late Latin comes from. Where that comes from is unknown. Some have suggested from a Celtic root. Mm. Huh. But really, it can't be traced back much further than that. Sorry, I'm I'm just sitting here thinking about the fact (laughs) that we don't know where the word petit is from. It's a very common word. Yeah. And it looks like a Latin word, right? Like it Mm. has, I mean, there is a word petitus, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean anything to do with that. So, okay. (laughs) Just going to contemplate that for a bit. Pet the verb comes from pet the noun? Yes. Okay. Yes. Pet the verb first appears in 1620s. Okay. Also, the the sense of a spoilt child goes back quite far. Oh, right. Like a teacher's pet kind of idea. Teacher's pet kind of idea. So the word comes into English probably from a Scots Gaelic word. So pet does, okay, so it doesn't just arise in English. No. So it first arrives in English in Scotland. Okay. Because it came from a Scots Gaelic word. Okay. But Um, we don't know where the Scots Gaelic word goes. No. So some, as I say, some people have connected it to petty maybe, or, you know, some root thereof. Mm -hmm. Right. Because petty, petit may come from a Celtic word. Okay. Sorry. I didn't catch all of these connections mm-hmm. the first time through. Getting it now, right? That er, that old Irish word is peta. That may be the, the source of all of these. Mm-hmm. What does it mean? It means tame animal. Okay. Pet, basically. And also it referring to sometimes to spoiled child. child. Right. So but that, it, that double sense goes back. But we can't take it to an Indo-European far. root. Is that can't take it back to an Indo-European root unless you believe the alternate theory, which is the one that the Oxford English Dictionary goes with, goes with mm-hmm. that it probably, as they say, ultimately comes from an extended form of the Proto-Indo-European root, which lies behind the Latin suescra. I don't know why they put it that way, but so it's the third person reflexive. Suus. Yeah. Se. Su Su or se, Se. that that su or se root. It's swe in Proto-Indo-European, and it gives us all of those reflexive. Yeah, yeah, but it, and so somehow that becomes pe? Yes. Well, 
presumably that's a sound change that happens from Proto-Indo-European into Celtic. Okay. And maybe that's a, a change that is no one, a sound change. Yes. So it would be this, the reflexive because it's something like connected uh, to myself, something I like, my, my own. My animal. Or her yeah, animal. That's true. Her own animal. One's own animal. I suppose it could be that. His or her own. Yeah. Yeah. Still weird. It is weird. They And the OED doesn't explain the semantic shift that lies behind that. So I'm not quite sure what, their reasoning what that is, means. Yeah. Okay, so pet, we don't know where, we it, don't comes know where from, it comes from, but most immediately it does come from Scots yes. Gaelic. <clears throat> yeah, okay. so it first appears in, in Scots, in, in Scottish English. That much we know. <laughs> okay. So as for pets themselves, the other thing that we have to sort of decide on is what is the definition of a pet right. as opposed to any kind of tame mm -hmm. or domesticated animal. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't- All the range of animals that live in association with humans. Humans, yeah. So what makes something a cattle. pet? Cattle. Yeah. Cattle we wouldn't really call pets. Though, though you could have a pet cow. You could have a pet cow. And you, you might have uh, a close relationship to your livestock. Well, but also like on farms and something, a kid might have a pet, pet calf, calf, right? That yeah. they raise for shows and stuff like that. That's and they true. think of as being their pet. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fact that it's a cow that makes it completely in ineligible to be a pet. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my point. Mm -hmm. You can have a pet goat. But you could also have a herd of goats that weren't pets. Right. Those would be different things. So what is it that distinguishes them? Well, and I should quote my sources here. There's one particular book that I drew on for this podcast. Mm -hmm. And actually her definition of pet, she actually takes from other sources herself okay. or modifies from, from other sources herself. But I'll just point you to, to the book that I looked mm -hmm. at specifically. Mm -hmm. It's by Kathleen Walker Makel called Medieval Pets. Mm-hmm. And so the definition that she sort of goes with, mm -hmm. so there's, there's two criteria here. One, uh, it has to be a companion animal serving no purpose other than companionship. Okay, so no utilitarian purpose. No utilitarian purpose. And that it lives indoors primarily. Okay. Not outdoors or not in a specially uh, purpose-built animal shelter. So uh, like a, a stable or a, a pen or a kennel or whatever. So it doesn't actually have to come, for instance, from the class of domesticated animals. Inf no. So it could be a wild animal. It could be a wild animal kept in a cage. But it can be a domesticated animal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or a wild animal that's been tamed. True. Right. That's a domesticated tamed. Right, right. animal yes, is... Yes, okay, is, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So given in particular this notion that pets live indoors, mm -hmm. in terms of medieval society, pets tend to belong to or are associated with people who live primarily, live an indoor life, mm -hmm. an indoor mm -hmm. lifestyle. And so this was actually this is actually a, a kind of important distinction in in terms of medieval society. Women and clerics and so forth live indoor lifestyles. Mm -hmm. Lay men tend to live outdoor lifestyles. So their primary activities are warring mm -hmm. and hunting and farming and farming. Because you're also talking. I think there's an element here. She may have talked about it, but of, of class. Of too. class. In lower economic class strata, mm -hmm. in more recent years anyway, it's not that people don't ever have pets. They certainly do. Mm -hmm. Children, though, have pets. Adults tend not to have pets that aren't also working animals. Right. We'll get to dogs mm -hmm. in a moment. So you can have strong affection, mm -hmm. but there's a much smaller incidence of pure pets mm -hmm. To some extent, there probably was sort of pet ownership in lower classes yeah. as well, though I don't have enough evidence for it. But the indoor-outdoor distinction still probably makes sense because mm -hmm. well, that's you're, why I you're brought a farmer up, if you're yeah, a man. That's why I brought up farming. Yeah. Whereas Women women's work is indoors. would be done more indoors. Mm -hmm. So lay men, therefore, were associated with outdoor animals like hunting dogs and horses and mm -hmm. so forth. Hawks. Hawks, yeah. Whereas at, women are going to be associated with the animals that are usually pet. pets. Pets. <clears throat> right. We think of as pets, which we'll get into those types in a minute. Mm -hmm. The same basically holds true, I think, in the ancient world in terms of who we see having pets and who pets are most associated with. And I will say that I didn't find a, a source that it was as well conceptualized as you did. Uh, mm -hmm. There are such things, but I just wasn't able to get my hands on them. So I'm working off my own imperfect knowledge rather than a, a source here. But in the same way, women and children are the most strongly associated with pets. Right. And definitely children. Right. That's really important in our sources. And women. But men, there are men who have pets. Mm -hmm. There do seem to be men who have ornamental pets. But I think that might be because the men who have ornamental pets are very much of the highest classes where there's a leisure element associated with their life. Right. That is, I'm thinking of Roman men in particular, where there is a certain amount of sort of conspicuous leisure 
Right. And the, though the Romans did go hunting a bit, hunting wasn't as big a deal upper for them. Class yeah, as it wasn't. Well, it was upper class. There were upper class. It could be an upper class activity, but it not in the same sort of all consuming way it was in the medieval period, right. you know, where like it just became the marker of status. It doesn't have right. that same. It's a possible leisure activity for okay. the upper classes. So they did have some association with some pet animals, but mm. it is overwhelmingly, I think, mm. women and children who are associated with it. So in the same way, you get that. Right. In terms of the, well, there is no legal status, basically. Right. There's um, no legal distinction, distinction of, a pet. of a pet. Because they were not considered valuable work animals. Mm -hmm. So there were, there were laws that pertained to working animals. They had value. And so you had to be compensated if, a, you know, someone stole a pet, uh, stole, stole a working animal or whatever. Or hurt it or something. Yeah. yeah. Because so they, if they have monetary value mm -hmm. like that, then the law is going to regulate it. Right. But since pets didn't have that kind of monetary value, mm -hmm. they weren't sort of compensation setups. Yeah. yeah there, there wasn't really anything in the laws at the time. Now, a relevant issue mm -hmm. that would come up surrounding the idea of pets in the medieval world, well, in various ways, the, the religious implications of pet animals. Okay. Do dogs have souls? Do dogs have souls, for instance. So conventionally, the teaching was, at least at first, that animals were thought not to have souls at all. Mm-hmm. However, some began to argue, including Abelard of Bath, Thomas Aquinas, argued that since they have sensation and some amount of judgment, they have the judgment to desire certain things that are good for them and avoid things that they don't want, mm. they must have some kind of soul hmm. because that doesn't res that, that kind of judgment doesn't re reside in the body. It resides in humans, by in the their soul, belief, right. in the soul. This is being driven by the fact that clerics keep pets. <laughs> yes. Is that basically it? Do you think? I mean, well, I mean, that may be a realistically, that yeah. may be part of the reason mm -hmm. that they spend time discussing it. Indeed. You know, they've, they're fond of their pet and they want to know if they're going to be there in heaven. And of course, there is lots written about clerics and scholars and so forth owning pets. Should they own pets? Were right. they allowed to own pets? Right. What kind of pets? How they, they, were, they had to be stay out of the sacred places and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff on that. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the souls, the, the sort of final conclusion, therefore, was that they had souls, but they were not immortal souls. So when the animal died, the uh, soul disappears. Ah, uh, okay. So they aren't going to be in heaven. They aren't going to be in heaven. All dogs do not go to heaven. No. <laughs> hmm. Okay. The idea of whether animals had whatever past, soul isn't quite the right word, but you know, mm -hmm. the, the philosophers in the ancient world certainly yes. did discuss animals. I don't know that they did it in any terms that was specific to pets, though. Yes, not specific to pets yeah. necessarily. But, you know, for instance, Aristotle apparently yeah. said animals have souls, but they are mortal souls. Mm -hmm. So the other way that pets are important in the medieval world is that they become identity markers mm -hmm. and are, become part of the persona, particularly of women. Okay. So as a way of establishing what their persona is like, the their pet choice, it kind of figures into that. Okay. So not just a status marker. Not just a status but marker. But I'm sure that's part that's of it. That's part yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. And similarly, to some extent for clerics. So in tr as identity markers, we therefore see pets in as uh, kind of iconography in paintings. Yes. In, in I mean, there's a lot of paintings with, and with so forth. people with people lap dogs with and their, their with pets. Their pets. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And pets also appear as a motif in representation of lay scholars. Okay. So it's not just the, the cloistered um, not just monks. Clerics, yeah. not just monks, mm -hmm. but also lay scholars. It seems to be, you know, I mean, this is the beginning of academic pets, basically. Right. Academic cats. Academic yeah. cats. Yeah. I mean, so I know academics have other animals, but really on Twitter anyway, it's just academic yeah. cats. <laughs> well, and in fact, in the Middle Ages, too, that was the sort of Obvious most scholarly. common pet for a scholar right. was a cat. Right. Well, because there were the, other, there were exceptions, but. The activity, non-activity. Yeah. So there you go. Academic cats goes right back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> the other kind of purpose that in, in terms of as kind of identity markers is obviously, as, as we said, alluded to before, as status markers. Mm -hmm. So we can see pets as an example, for instance, of conspicuous consumption. Mm -hmm. They are given special food, mm -hmm. not just allowed to, made to, you know, fend for themselves. Right. They're fed better than, than many, many humans. people. Yeah. yeah. They get special cushions to sit on and mm -hmm. nice collars. And... Mm -hmm. and so this then becomes a source of criticism from the church in particular. Mm. Especially because um, it's women doing it, of course. <laughs> yes. 
No, that wasn't a joke. That yeah. was <laughs> that's the, that's, the mm-hmm. that's where conspicuous consumption is most often Obvious, right. Uh, well, it's most often criticized by the church. Right. Okay, is when women do it. When women do it, right? Yeah. So, in particular, what the church said is spending all this money on pets and so forth instead of good works, instead mm-hmm. of spending it on you know charity for mm-hmm. the poor, mm-hmm. for instance. As if that was the option. Yeah. As if these people sitting around in their little castles were like, I might spend some money on fancy food for little my little pet. Or I might give it to a poor person. No, that was not the other option. (laughs) The other option was, or I won't spend it. Nevertheless, even in the church, it was acknowledged that pets were necessary for companionship, especially for people who lived isolated lives, as both women and clerics did. Right. You know, in, where they if, if you're in a cloistered community, yeah. right. you know, your time spend all your time in a cell copying endlessly mm-hmm. manuscripts and so forth. The companionship of an animal was valuable. Was yeah. valuable and, and necessary if that's your, what your life is. Now, another topic we wanted to come to is mourning for pets. Mm -hmm. So one reason that's important is because, at least in the ancient world, that's a big source of our understanding of pets. Mm. So in terms of having a source that talks about pets, one of the major sources we have is epitaphs on grave markers, not necessarily for pets, though also for pets. Pet cemetery. Well, yeah, Mm. but also a lot of representations of dead children with pets. Uh We don't have portraiture from the ancient world for the most part. We have a very, very small amount of it because it doesn't survive. But what we do have is grave markers. Mm -hmm. And grave markers in particular for children, children are very often represented with a pet. Hmm. And I think it is iconography for, well, there's a number of things it could be for, but one of the things is it's a marker of childhood. Mm -hmm. It's part of the pathetic element of a grave marker for a child Mm -hmm. that it it highlights their childhoodness and probably also is the thing that they had affection for and Mm -hmm. so it's tied to them but in the same way that an adult is shown with the tools of his trade sometimes for instance or shown in a context that makes it clear he's a senator or shown you know with those things that were important to them in life that show status Children are often shown with pets. But what that means is that one of the major sources we have for what kind of pets were had Mm -hmm. is what kind of pets are in those grave markers. The other thing, though, is what I think you were thinking of, which is actual epitaphs for pets. So we have a few of those. We have actual grave markers for pets. Pets. Not a lot. But the bigger genre was poetic eulogies or epitaphs, poetic epigrams for pets dead right. pets. And this was a whole genre in in particular, it's collected into book, I think, seven of the Greek anthology, which is a collection of Hellenistic and Roman era Greek poetry mm-hmm. from a whole bunch of different authors. And it's organized by theme in the collection as we have it. And book seven, as I said, I think it's book seven, is pet eulogies. That's all it is. Right. <laughs> it's like poems about pets. They're not all about them dead, but most of them are. They seem to have grown out of a real genre, but they've become a poetic genre that's often humorous, mm-hmm. you know, and is, is meant f- to be kind of a parody of actual grave epigrams right. or actual epigrams for dead people, but is sort of parodic and humorous. But some of them are very pathetic and sorrowful too. And so there's a whole bunch of them. And so that becomes a, a, a standard genre. Right. Um, I have some examples of that, which I think you were you're going to allude to, but I think I'll wait and sure. read them later. But I've yep. s- some there are some very specific and very famous literary Greek anthology is literary, but mm-hmm. it's um, doesn't have as high status in terms of it later importance. Mm-hmm. So the poems I'm thinking of are by Catullus and Marshall. Right. So we'll come back to those. And indeed, that genre continued into the Middle Ages. There were a great number of eulogies specifically to the pets of scholars, because mm. they're the ones writing the Which things down. Sense, yeah. mm-hmm. And these seem to have been very much influenced, very consciously influenced, in particular by Catullus, as well as other writers like Ovid and Statius and Marshall. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I want to talk about one specific example uh, mm-hmm. of a pet being mourned, mm-hmm. just, I guess, slightly late for, for the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. We're kind of getting into the Renaissance here, really. But the pets that belong to Isabella d'Este, who was a figure who appeared centrally in our most recent video. Mm-hmm. On Bellini. On Bellini. So she was a, an art patron in uh, the Italian Renaissance. Mm-hmm. And your new favorite person. Yes. She's <laughs> absolutely fascinating. So her favorite, she had many pets, but her very favorite uh, animal was her pet dog, Aura. A-U-R-A. Okay. She was very attached to this dog, and it went with her everywhere in the palace. And her courtiers and ladies-in-waiting could tell she was coming by the sounds of her, her pets. 
who right. would, would always go around with her. Was it a little lap dog? Yes. Right. Yeah. And I'll talk uh, uh, later about breeds of right. specific breeds of dogs that were common. But when this dog died, she was absolutely inconsolable. Mm. And there were many, many, not just like one or two, many, many elegies and epigrams sent to her by various writers around mm. Italy to commemorate this dog. <laughs> and her correspondent survives. So we have this. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. right. She, she had a, a very prolific correspondence mm -hmm. and all of this gets preserved so we can we know a lot about it, including her son, Federico, mm -hmm. who wrote her a letter by hand himself. So not written by a secretary or something. Mm -hmm. He wrote personally to his mother to console her and said he was going to send her some kittens mm. to uh, to Aww. to help her. <laughs> and this these letters that reference her grief at mm -hmm. the, the loss of this pet go on for like a year or more. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, she's sad for a month mm -hmm. or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. It continued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And her son that I mentioned, he was also an avid dog owner, which is unusual for men to be known as pet owners mm -hmm. in that way. And what, what's particularly unusual is that there's a painting of him with a little toy pet dog, dog right? pet yeah. dog, a yeah. little, I mean, it's not a, you know, not a not big a animal. Dog, it's, yeah. it's a little toy dog, a little lap dog with him sort of stroking the animal while the animal has one paw resting on his side. Hmm. It's very touching picture. Yeah. And it's, it's quite unusual in, in uh, medieval portraiture or to have yeah. that or sorry renaissance portraiture mm -hmm. so uh that's quite interesting painted by titian so mm -hmm. we can maybe put a picture of that in the um right isabella also had cats mm -hmm. and indeed after the loss of her favorite dog she seemed to turn to cats then as as consolation mm -hmm. she got these kittens sent by her son in fact even before that she wanted to acquire cats specifically cats from syria mm -hmm. and so she had her agents uh, scouring Syria scouring, for cats. Well, not scouring Syria, but scouring the markets around Italy. To, for Syrian for, cats. For Syrian for cats that had been imported from Syria. And so one cat became her, her sort of favorite. His name was Martino. <laughs> and again, when he died, she, you know, again, was quite, was she cat. mourned for him quite a bit. Aww. <laughs> so Aura and Martino. Aww, those okay. Are two <laughs> crucial pets. Isabella's pets. Isabella's pets, pets yeah. Well, speaking of dogs, why don't we turn then to dogs as the first major pet category? Sure. So we'll start off with etymologies here. We'll start with the most common word for dogs today in English, dog. <laughs> Again, this is a mystery word. It sort of appeared out of nowhere. And it's actually one of these quite notable mystery words that people always talk about right. in, in etymology circles. <laughs> so it appear, the word appears once in late Old English. Mm. And then it grows in popularity in the Middle English period. Mm -hmm. That one Old English appearance is in a gloss. So it's not even in, in uh, running is, text. Where it's defined like a gloss of a Latin word? Of a Latin word, right. yeah. So this is where the, the practice of writing a note next to a word yeah. to explain what the word means. So it glosses words. Latin canis. Right. So you know what it is. We you know, know what it is. Mean. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't until the 13th century that the word became popular, and it wasn't really until the 16th century that it replaced the older native word for dog, which is hound. Right. As, as the, the general main, word. The general word. Because obviously hound still exists. Yeah. yeah. So it has no known relatives in any European language except words that barred it later. Mm. So all the cognates clearly are borrowing from the English word okay. and come much later. There's no old words that it could be related to. There's no from. way to, at all to, to say where it comes from. There's no other... Right. There have been some theories, but nothing that's very convincing. All right. So that's dog. So that's dog. Now, as I said, the, the sort of older English word mm -hmm. that was the kind of default term for dog, mm -hmm. the umbrella term for dog, is hound. Mm -hmm. It appears as hund in Old English. We can trace that back to a, a root, mm -hmm. Proto-Indo-European root quo, Mm -hmm. which also is the source of canis. Which is Latin. Which is the Latin. And gives us canine. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's okay. Interestingly, though, I will point out that from this dog root come a number of other words beside the obvious ones like canine. Mm -hmm. Cynic. Yes, right. From the Greek for the 
from the word Greek dog. for the word dog. It's a matter of debate as to why that, that shift happens. Well, I mean, we know that it was a word that started to be used of a philosophical sect. Yes. And that the word cynic in English comes from the name of that philosophical, that philosophical sect. sect. Why they were called cynics, why they were called dog people, that's the that's matter the, of debate. That's, yeah. 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 And there are a number of theories that it, it might have to do with the nature of that philosophical sect, mm -hmm. that they're somehow doggy in behavior or something, mm -hmm. barking and growling and, yeah. you know, that kind of. Yeah. The other idea is that it comes from the name of a gymnasium, which was where a particular follower of, of, of cynicism taught. Right. So that particular gymnasium was called Kunos Sarge. Who knows what the where that comes from? Where yeah. that actually comes from? Another word that surprisingly comes from the Latin word canis mm -hmm. is canary. So another possible pet, as it turns out. Right. So the way this happens is it, it comes from the Canary Islands. So that island was the set of islands. That set of islands in the Atlantic originally received that Latin name because they found wild dogs living there. Right, so, so the dog, dog island. islands. Yeah. Later on, the island was noted for this particular bird that lived on the island. Mm -hmm. And so that bird then therefore came to be known as canaries because right. they're the birds from the Canary Islands. Yeah, I so just like the fact that it's another pet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and it is uh, not intuitive at all that no. birds would be named yeah. after dogs because they're not named after yeah. dogs. They're yeah. named after the place. Yeah. yeah. So canary yellow is dog yellow. The color. <laughs> yes, I guess that's true. <laughs> <laughs> which is a yellow dog, which is a whole other kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so did you have anything specific to say about dogs in the ancient world? Well, yes. So dogs are obviously a major type of pets. Now, they do straddle this line. Mm -hmm. There are lots and lots of dogs in the ancient world that are hunting dogs. Mm -hmm. So that's their main employment mm -hmm. in the ancient world as it is later. And we have a fair number of famous hunting dogs. They are also, though, pets. Now, this is where it, there is a, that fuzzy line because right. there are certainly men who have hunting dogs that they have are very affectionate towards, mm -hmm. that have strong affectionate ties. The most famous of those is in the Odyssey. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows this one, but I'm going to read it anyway, because I asked on Twitter for people's favorite pets. Right. And more than one person mentioned this passage, especially Dimitri and Cassus brought it up, among others, for instance. So famously, when Odysseus comes back from the his travels, uh, he's in disguise and he comes to his palace for the first time in disguise. No one knows except for his son. And he is disguised as a beggar. And as he comes into the palace uh, in disguise to begin to wreak his vengeance on the suitors, he's talking to someone in the courtyard. And I'll read the um, Emily Wilson translation of the new Odyssey mm -hmm. that you see our earlier episode, episode. <laughs> mm -hmm. interview with her. So as they're speaking in the courtyard, as they spoke, Argos, the dog that lay there, raised his head and ears. Odysseus had trained this dog, but with no benefit. He left too soon to march on holy Troy. The master gone, the boys took at the puppy out to hunt wild goats and deer and hares. But now he lay neglected, without an owner, in a pile of dung from mules and cows. The slaves stored heaps of it outside the door until they fertilized the large estate. So Argos lay there dirty, covered with fleas. And when he realized Odysseus was near, he wagged his tail and both his ears dropped back. He was too weak to move towards his master. At a distance, Odysseus had noticed, and he wiped his tears away and hid them easily, and said, Eumaeus, it is strange this dog is lying in the dung. He looks quite handsome, though it is hard to tell if he can run or if he is a pet, a table dog, kept just for looks. Eumaeus, you replied, this dog belonged to someone who has died in foreign lands. If he were in good health, as when Odysseus abandoned him and went to Troy, you soon would see how quick and brave he used to be. He went to hunt in woodland, and he always caught his prey. His nose was marvellous. But now he is in bad condition with his master gone, long dead. The women fail to care for him. Slaves do not want to do their proper work when masters are not watching them. Zeus halves our value on the day that makes us slaves. With that, the swineherd went inside the palace to join the noble suitors. Twenty years had passed since Argos saw Odysseus, and now he saw him for the final time. Then suddenly, black death took hold of him. That's his one little cameo, mm -hmm. but there are many people who said, oh, that always makes me cry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's there. I mean, it's important to the poem in all sorts of ways. You know, the first recognition token that it really is Odysseus. And, right. And all of and the pathos and all of this stuff. That's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons that he should be there. But nonetheless, what we have there is that, yes, he's a hunting dog, mm -hmm. but 
It's the bond of affection Mm -hmm. between the two of them. And interesting that Odysseus says, is he a hunting dog dog or or just a pet pet, kept just for for looks? So even in the Odyssey, we have that suggestion Mm. that he could be just a pet. I wonder what the Greek word used there is. Would you like me to look? I can can look. (laughs) All right. So having looked it up, (laughs) the words in Greek, there's no specific word for a pet. Okay. What there is, is it says very literally, you know, is this is this a swift and good hunting dog mm-hmm. or one of those sorts of dog fed at the table that people have? Right. OK. One who is there to be good looking. So the phrase trapeze is kunes mm. is table fed dogs. Table fed dogs. Trapeze, that comes from the word a, right. a table, trapeze. So there's not a specific word for pet. Mm. Or pet dog even. But that is, apparently it appears more than once as a phrase in Homer. So there was a category of dog, dogs kept and fed at the table as opposed right. to in a kennel. So that gets you that interior mm-hmm. in inside element of the house right. pet, right? Like that's a house mm-hmm. pet. It's fed at the table rather than fed in the kennels like a normal hound dog would be. By the way, did you know we get the word trapeze from trapeze? Well, I've always assumed so. <laughs> even though it's not a, and a table in any sense. <laughs> a table in any sense. I mean, where else could it possibly come from? (laughs) Also, trapezoid. Yeah. That makes a little more sense in some ways. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah, it does. The trapeze is because the the arrangement of the the ceiling, the two lines that come down from the ceiling, and the bar that the- Make a trapezoid. Make a trapezoid. And a trapezoid is named that because it looks like- Well, with the legs and the top. It's like- And the floor. And the floor. Yeah, it's that shape. Right, right. So anyway, (laughs) so that's sort of the most famous, in a way, pet dog, even Mm. though he's not a pet dog Mm. in literature. But there's also a a wonderful list in Ovid that I won't read, but Acteon goes hunting in the Metamorphoses of Ovid Mm -hmm. with his pack of hunting dogs. Oh, yeah. And everyone is named. There's this big, long catalog of the names of his dogs. And they're all named, and they have these wonderful, you know, really speaking names. Mm -hmm. Swifty and Fast Catcher and Wind and all this. But in truly Ovidian twist, the reason, and he loves his dogs, and Mm -hmm. the reasons Mm -hmm. are so lovingly named and described is because later in this myth, of course, they're going to tear Tear him to pieces because he's going to be turned into a deer and he's Mm -hmm. going to be torn apart by his own dogs. So that's why we have this concentration on them. So that's another passage somebody brought up on Twitter. Now, those are very much hunting dogs, though, not pets. As pets, there were also lap dogs, definitely lap dogs. And in Roman period in particular, we have a fair amount of images of that, but also in in earlier periods. Mm -hmm. The most favored lap dog was the Melitean, which was from Africa, probably, from Carthaginian Africa, and imported to Malta, or maybe somewhere else, which is why it's got that name. The name means Malta, yeah. Yeah, Maltese. And that seems to have been the sort of favorite, but there are other kinds as well. There is a poem by Marshall on a pet dog that I will read to you because it's a kind of typical. This is Marshall 1109, but the dog Issa. Issa is more playful than the sparrow of Catullus. We'll come back to Catullus and his sparrow. Issa is more pure than the kiss of a dove. Issa is more loving than any maiden. Issa is dearer than Indian gems. The little dog Issa is the pet of Publius. So that's a man or boy, anyway. Mm-hmm. If she complains, you will think she speaks. She feels both the sorrow and the gladness of her master. She lies reclined upon his neck and sleeps so that not a respiration is heard from her. And, however pressed, she has never sullied the coverlet with a single spot. <laughs> but rouses her master with a gentle touch of her foot and begs to be set down from the bed and relieved. Such modesty resides in this chaste little animal. She knows not the pleasures of love, nor do we find a mate worthy of so tender a damsel. That her last hour may not carry her off wholly, Publius has her limbed in a picture, so painted, hmm. in which you will see an Issa so like that not even herself is so like herself. In a word, place Issa and the picture side by side, and you will imagine either both real or both painted. <laughs> so um, the point of the poem really is this conceit right. of the lifelike painting. But I think if you had any doubt at all that in antiquity there were pet Pets, dogs, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a pet dog for sure. And seems to be of a man mm-hmm. for the record. Mm-hmm. So I just thought I'd give you that. And then this idea of dogs being a marker of status and also memorialized. Mm-hmm. 
in the Satyricon by Petronius and in the section with Trimalchio, Trimalchio's dinner, which is a parody of this jumped up freedman who got really rich and is all crass and mm-hmm. everything. He, at one point, the big long section of this story is about, he starts imagining his own funeral mm-hmm. and he tells you everything that's going to happen. He ends up like play acting his own funeral. But at the beginning of it, he says, he's talking to his friends and says, um, here's what I want you to do for my funeral. I beg you earnestly to put round the feet of my statue when I'm dead, my little dog. And then later he says, on my right hand, put a statue of dear Fortunata, his wife, Mm -hmm. holding a dove and let her be leading a little dog with a waistband on, which is probably a collar, but they seem to around the The middle middle Mm -hmm. instead of around the neck. So we have the idea that his his grave is going to be, like I said before, Mm -hmm. marked with him with his pet and his wife with her pets, a dove and a dog. So just thought those were two good extracts to tell you about. Mm -hmm. Well, in the Middle Ages, dogs were the most common pet right by far and indeed the most common breed of dogs is the same that you mentioned the maltese Mm -hmm. and in fact you can see a picture of such a dog in the very famous lady in the unicorn tapestries right one of the tapestries shows a little maltese very clearly a little white lap dog Mm -hmm. so it's very clear what's what breed it is sitting on a brocade cushion also interestingly in that set of tapestries you can see a pet monkey. Mm-hmm. We'll come to monkeys in a moment. So we'll come to monkeys later. Another possible breed of dog that was known in the Middle Ages is the Spaniel, mm-hmm. so-called, mm-hmm. because it was supposedly of Spanish origin. Right. Now, in terms of beliefs about dogs mm-hmm. in the, the Middle Ages, the first place to look, obviously, is the Bible. Mm, right. And in the Bible, dogs are mostly negative yeah. in association. The one exception to this is in the book of Tobit, in which Tobias is accompanied by his faithful pet dog as he searches to find a cure for his father's blindness. Hmm. So one there good is dog. One dog. There's one good dog. Yeah. Otherwise, mostly in the Bible, dogs appear only when they tear pe- people to pieces, right? Yeah, or they yeah. eat, eat corpses and mm-hmm. things. They're a threat. Yeah. Throwing you to the dogs. Now, in medieval literary contexts, Hildegard von Bingen writes about a number of different pet animals, and of dogs, she claims that dogs can prognosticate. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. She would be the expert on this, I suppose. What, weirdo theories? (laughs) (laughs) And she said that the devil hates dogs because of their loyalty to humans. Okay. So Um, she thinks dogs do go to heaven. (laughs) I guess. (laughs) Another belief in about dogs in the Middle Ages is that they were believed to be able to identify their master's murderer. And so there are uh, some yeah, yeah. historical records of this actually happening. This right. being so uh, when uh, someone had mysteriously died mm-hmm. and then a dog attacked someone, attacked someone, the dog belonging, belonging to the dead man attacked someone or was mm-hmm. aggressive towards someone, uh, he was accused of uh, the murder. The murder. Mm-hmm. And so there's a number of interesting stories about that kind of thing. And, of course, dogs are known for their loyalty and devotion right up to the point of death. You know, they won't leave Mm -hmm. their owner and remain by their grave. The interesting thing to note, though, is all these stories about dogs' devotion to their masters Mm -hmm. is always to their masters, Mm. not to women. Right, right. There's no stories of that particularly highlight the, the faithfulness of the dog when it's a woman who's who's the owner. Right. Even though they mostly had the pets. Yeah. In sort of kind of more literary type of texts, mm-hmm. a pet, especially a dog, is is often uh, pictured as the comfort for a lady given to her by her lover in medieval romances. For when, for when he's not when there. When he's not there, she right. needs a you know comforting animal. And often he gives her the animal. And, right. and, and he sort of stands in as his surrogate. His, yeah. Not literally. <laughs> And the most famous <laughs> example of this is in the uh, various romances of Tristan and Isolde. Oh, yeah. And so there are different versions of this uh, romance. In some mm-hmm. versions, the dog even has kind of magical powers and things. Right. So right. It, it's quite significant to the story. Right. But that's not the, the literary example I want to particularly stress. That's a pretty well-known one. The one I want to stress is perhaps a little less well-known, mm-hmm. is the dog in Njal's saga. Ah, yes. The dog is called Sam, or really, it's Salmer. Tell people what Njal Saga is. So Njal Saga is an Old Norse family saga, a saga of the Icelanders, right. uh, that tells the story of you know generations of people in Iceland right. and their 
various things that they get Mostly up to. Mostly revenge. Revenge. Yeah, this one in particular <laughs> is, a, is a series of revenges. Yeah. And uh, the dog's name is Sa- Sam. Well, that's how, how we always said it. But of course, it's not related to Samuel or anything like right. that. It's uh, actually the Norse word Samur, which means dark colored. Mm. And in fact, it's a personal name too. Right. Oh, Argos, I should have said in, in the Odyssey, means swift. Swift. Okay. Or maybe white. Okay. There's a little white shining. There's a little debate on that. Debate on that? Well, in this Norse saga, this dog is given to one of the main characters, Gunnar, by someone named Olaf or Pai, who is descended from the Irish king Mirkjartan. Okay. So the person who gives the dog is descended from descended an Irish from king. An Irish king. Okay. Yeah. So this dog is an Irish dog, therefore. Right. And he says, I want to give you three, three gifts, a gold bracelet, a cloak that once belonged to King Mirjartan of Ireland, and a dog I was given in Ireland. He was a big animal and will make as good a comrade in arms as a powerful man. He has human intelligence, and he will bark at every man he recognizes as your enemy, but never at your friends. He can tell from a man's face whether he means you well or not. He would lay down his life rather than fail you. His name is Sam. So So he has this sort of psychic dog or something. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And so Gunnar's enemies realize they have to get rid of this dog because Mm -hmm. they're trying to bump him off. Right. And the dog is stopping them. Is stopping them, is saving them all the time. So they basically set up this sort of ploy using someone. They force someone that he knows to be a distraction Mm -hmm. and the dog doesn't bark at him. And then they're able to kill the dog. And so I'll just read you that that little passage. Onund of Trollwood drove his axe deep into the dog's head, right down to the brain. The animal uttered a loud howl, the like of which none had ever heard before, and fell down dead. Inside the house, Gunnar woke up. You have been harshly treated, Sam, my fosterling, he said. It may well be fated that my turn is coming soon. And is he then burned inside his house? That's Njal. No, it's Njal who gets Njal burned inside his house. Burned. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poor Sam. Poor Sam. Yeah. He might have been a wolfhound then, eh? Yeah. That's that's, what that's people the think. presumption. Yeah. yeah. Big Irish dog. Big yeah. Irish dog. Yeah. So yeah, that story has always stayed with me since I read it as a <laughs> master student. Yeah, I seem to remember you telling me about that when you were in grad school. <laughs> Sam the dog. Sam the dog. I felt so sad when he died. Yeah, we'll see the the <laughs> Odyssey's Argos and Sam the dog, right? There's a there's a connection there. Mm-hmm. Hi, guys. So while editing this, I realized that it was very long. The raw audio was two hours for this topic. We had a lot to say about pets. So for my sake and yours, I've decided to break it into two episodes. So I'm going to stop here. We've talked about pets in general and dogs. Next episode, which will be out in two weeks, will cover cats and a variety of other possibly more unusual pets that the ancient and medieval world enjoyed keeping. So look for that. It'll be the continuation. There won't be a new cocktail because it's just the same conversation, but that will be coming in two weeks. In the meantime, go out and pet your pets. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.